Fermentation. It turns relatively normal food into something magical. And while the concept is simple, it doesn't always turn out like you hope. Trust me, I've fermented all kinds of drinks on this channel, from ginger bug, to kombucha, to tapage, to kefir, to even fermented sodas like root beer and sparkling lemonade. And I've had my fair share of ups and downs. And so have you. So today I'm finally putting all my years of fermenting knowledge together in one video to help answer your 10 most common fermentation questions. All leading up to the most frequent question that I get on almost every video. And I'm ready to settle it once and for all. But first, let's get started with a doozy of a question. Number one, will this kill me? Got poison! I understand the concern. I mean, we are consuming bacteria and bacteria is bad, right? Well, not exactly. There's what I like to call good bacteria and bad bacteria. The good is what fuels most home fermentation projects, and it's called lactobacillus, the same natural bacteria that makes fermented pickles, sourdough, or even yogurt. There are a few bad bacteria, but the one most people are concerned with is Clostridium botulinium, aka the one that causes botulism, which could lead to death if not cared for. But it is extremely rare. In the US, there's an average of 110 cases of botulism reported each year with only 25% being related to food. As far as I could read, there were zero deaths by botulism in the US in 2023. With proper cleaning, using only fresh ingredients, and care along the way, you will not be in any danger. And on that note, number two, should I wash the fruit or vegetable first? Won't that wash off all the good stuff? This is particularly in reference to fermentations that use the ingredient whole or include the skin of the fruit or veg, something like pineapple tapache or ginger beer. And without a doubt, the answer is yes, wash the skins. Washing with soap and water will not harm the lactobacteria because it's all over and inside the food. So there's plenty to go around. But by not washing it, you're giving the bad bacteria a chance to take hold of the fermentation, leading to most of the issues you're probably having. More on that in a few questions. But just think about the life of a pineapple. It's grown on a farm, then trucked across the country, maybe even on a plane, and then it makes its way to your grocery store. Many hands have touched it, not to mention it might have fallen on the ground or who knows what. Also, the possibility of any growth or staling inhibitors that grocery companies might spray on it. So just do yourself a favor and wash it first. Number three, what can I ferment in? The answer to this is honestly endless, as long as it's clean and has some lid or cover to release pressure but not let any bugs in. Some ferments can go a bit acidic, which means metal materials can corrode due to their higher pH. So avoid metal fermenters or tools, unless you're talking about stainless steel which is generally okay. I mean, if it's okay for the big kombucha companies, then it's good for us. My preferred fermenters are glass or plastic. Plastic is cheap to buy, but it's also easily scratchable, which can lead to grooves where bacteria can hang out and get into all kinds of trouble for you. Glass is probably the best because it can last for years if you don't have butterfingers and drop it. Plus, mason jars are plenty and perfect for fermentation experiments. Number four, can you make it alcoholic? Jokes aside, you can make anything alcoholic by adding some brewing yeast. Just add it right at the start and you'll have an alcoholic version of the drink. But it won't really have any of the probiotic or funky attributes of ferments that we love. It'll just have the booze. Number five, why is mine thick, almost jelly-like? Remember when I said to wash your fruit or veg? Well, if you don't, you'll likely get an infection from a bad bacteria. It can happen other ways, but it could be the result of something like pediococcus. <laughs> I know, it sounds funny or some other bacteria that can change the texture during fermentation. Luckily, in most cases, the thick, ropey consistency will go away with time. So try to be patient, and it should thin back to normal and taste completely fine. But if you want, you can always just try again. The one thing about fermentation that you'll realize is that not every batch is gonna be perfect. Maybe you did wash it and do everything right, but you just got bad luck. Don't give up, keep trying, and you'll get it, I promise. Number six, why isn't mine fermenting or carbonating? Along the same note of things not always going right, sometimes the bacteria can just be slow or seemingly unmotivated. If you're noticing no activity of fermentation, give it another couple days, making sure it's in a warm area around 69 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Cold temps will slow the fermentation down, making it seem like nothing's happening. Still nothing? Then try adding more of your lactose source, like the ginger skin and maybe a bit more sugar to rile things up. The last thing to check is your water source. Tap water can have chloramines that inhibit bacteria growth meaning no fermentation for you. So try switching to spring water or bottled water. As far as carbonation, the key is to make sure there's enough extra sugars to keep the fermentation going after you close the top of your bottle and keep it closed. You need the fermentation to keep going and build pressure to create carbonation. 
and after a few days, throw it in the fridge to keep the CO2 in your drink. If you open a warm carbonated drink, it'll just fizz out and leave you with no bubbles to enjoy. Number seven, do I really need to burp the bottles? It depends, really. If you have a ton of leftover sugars or adding more sugars to the bottle, then it might get really active in there and need to be released. But in all the videos that I've made on fermented drinks and in my many years of experience, I've never needed to burp or quickly release pressure every few days. I usually just set it on the counter for two to five days, depending on the temp of the room and that particular ferment, and then toss it in the fridge. But one tip I can give is to use plastic bottles instead of glass. This gives you the chance to see and feel the pressure of the bottle, giving you a better idea of how fizzy it might be. When it feels hard, that means it's time to refrigerate ASAP. Number eight, how long does it last? I usually consume these within two weeks of making them, but I've had ginger beer sitting in the fridge for about six months and it still tasted fine. So it just depends on your taste preference. I will say that it tastes best fresh, and the longer it sits in your fridge, the more it'll continue to ferment, just at a much slower rate. So if you do want to age something like these ferments, then maybe you should consider burping every couple weeks so you don't have a bottle bomb on your hands later. But like you would observe the fermentation to look out for signs of things going bad, like mold or weird growth on top, do the same with your older ferments. And if you're unsure, it's best to toss and make a new batch. Number nine, is this keto? Well, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a guy on YouTube that likes fermenting. But with a quick Google search, keto is a low carb, high fat diet. And sugar, the main fermentable in all the fermentations, is a type of carbohydrate. So no, this kefir or any of these fermentations are not keto friendly. Which finally brings us to the number one most common question I get on these fermentation videos. And I'm guaranteed to still get it, but I'll definitely try to answer it here. Number 10, can I use blank instead of sugar? So I use plain table sugar in almost all these videos because one, it's easy to find, two, it's cheap, and three, the bacteria and yeast just love it. But I get that you might wanna try something less processed or maybe something that's considered more healthy than granulated sugar. For the most part, I'll answer your question with a blanket, yes with an apostrophe. Yes to any natural sugars out there. Things like maple syrup, honey, raw cane sugar, fruit and fruit juice, malt extract, coconut sugar, brown sugar, even molasses can work. But no to anything labeled a sweetener or that's usually zero calorie. This is your Splenda, Equal, Stevia, and monk fruit. They don't have the fermentable sugars needed to make the fermentation work, meaning the yeast and the bacteria then have nothing to consume. So go wild with your locally sourced alfalfa honey just keep the sweet and low away. So what did I miss? What other questions do you have? Send them my way and keep a lookout for more fermentation projects. I've got a few planned, so stay subscribed to not miss a thing. And here's a playlist with all the fun fermentations I've made so far. Enjoy.